Good morning. Uh, you are welcome to another uh, continuous medical education organized by Kurnagal Medical Association. Um, so today we are moving from COVID to uh, other important topics. So uh, we are going. We are starting uh, emergency management, uh, medical, surgical, and other disciplines. So we have uh, uh, we have lined up a few lectures on emergency management. And today we are going to start a very important uh, first uh, uh, management of uh, uh, emergency. So that is arrhythmia. So arrhythmia management is uh, is an art actually. So uh, is it is uh, my great pleasure and uh, privilege to introduce uh, today's speaker of that note is Dr. Keith Devulvavel. Right? He is a very young consultant, but he is very energetic and you know very active in uh, 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 management of patients as well as other. Uh, uh, academic events. So um, he uh, is uh, board uh, certified uh, as a consultant um, electro uh, electrophysiologist uh, in 2009-19 and um, now he is uh, working as acting consultant uh, uh, electrophysiologist and uh, hoping to uh, uh, get the uh, proper uh, post uh, at Kurnagala. Um, so it's uh, going to be a privilege to us uh, to be with him for a clinical work as well. So without taking much time, so I would uh, invite uh, Dr. Heerthi to, uh, to do his presentation. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the kind words of introduction by our uh, doc Dr. Nala Kaherat, consultant nephrologist, uh, president of uh, Kurnagala Medical Association. Uh, without further ado, I will start with my presentation. Today, I'm going to uh, briefly discuss about how we are going to uh, set about managing uh, patients who are presented with uh, arrhythmia, especially at the a &E department level. Arrhythmic management uh, over the past uh, few decades has been evolved extensively, and most of these uh, arrhythmias now can be permanently fixed by doing catheter ablation. Um, so, as you can see, uh, broadly, arrhythmic uh, uh, conditions can be uh, classified into either tachyarrhythmia. Tachy, all these terms are Latin terms derived uh, from uh, Latin, and uh, tachy means going faster and bradi means going slower. So, in, in, in technical terms, tachycardia means when the heart rate is more than 100. Uh, I specifically use the word tachycardia. So there is a distinction between tachycardia and tachyarrhythmia. And tachycardia is a more of a broad term and bradycardia likewise is a broad term. Uh, so when a pa patient presented with having a heart rate of more than 100, we simply call them in tachycardia. And when a patient presented with a heart rate of less than 60, by technical terms, it is called bradycardia. Uh, most importantly, when a arrhythmic uh, condition present with either any of these associated symptoms, then there is certain uh, risk of threat to life. So in that situation, we call them or consider them as uh, arrhythmic emergencies. You can appreciate that uh, uh, syncope. Uh, syncope means transient loss of consciousness and uh, or persistent reduced level of consciousness when there's evidence of ongoing myocardial ischemia. So it could be either primary ileal caused by the arrhythmia or arrhythmia is caused by the myocardial ischemia. Or when a patient is having evidence of peripheral tissue under perfusion, that is hypotension, or when the patient presented with heart failure. So now we move on to bradycardia management. You can see that uh, as I mentioned earlier, when a, bradic a patient is having a heart rate of less than 60, it is considered as bradycardia. But this is the most important point. When a person who's at rest and alert, having a heart rate of less than 40, that is certainly very abnormal. So in between 60 to 40, it's conditional. But however, at any circumstances, the heart rate is low, below 40 when the patient is alert and rest. This could change when a pa person is sleeping. As we know, some people, when they are at sleep, heart rate I have seen going down as low as 20, but that is not considered as abnormal. But when a patient is alert, awake, and at, at resting, 
the heart rate is when the heart rate is low, less than 40, that is abnormal. Uh, salient point is sinus bradycardia is not generally life threatening, uh, but complete heart block is life threatening. And uh, people can die of complete heart block in two ways. One thing, as we know, when the conduction stops at the AV node level, in nature, there is always an escape mechanism. However, that escape mechanism is not very reliable. And sometimes the escape mechanism can simply give away, giving rise to ventricular standstill. That means the ventricle doesn't con don't contract, there's no cardiac output, patient collapse. The other possibility is when, when someone is in extreme bradycardia, it leads to uh, what we call depolarization abnormality. The, the electrical uh, propagation is going to change. And as a result, uh, there's a thing called uh, after depolarization. That's one mechanism of arrhythmia generation, and it can lead to sudden QT prolongation, and that will initiate ventricular fibrillation. So complete heart block patient can die of two reasons. And we can, uh, in an ANE situation, uh, we can come up with a certain scenario like this. Inferior MI patient, quite common to have uh, heart blocks. But uh, in, in that setup, having a heart block with a heart rate of 35 normally doesn't give rise troubles. And when the ischemia settles, it improves. However, if a patient presented with anterior stay elevation MI and having a heart block, that is a sinister situation because it, normally in anterior MI, the conduction system does not get involved. But when the lesion is at very high, like very proximal LAD obstruction, it will significantly cut off blood supply to the, the bundle of his and the left bundle. And these patients are at higher risk of dying suddenly. On the other hand, complete heart block with a narrow escape rhythm. That means the, the escape rhythm is originating from either uh, inferior part of the AV node or bundle of his. They are very stable rhythms. So that does not normally cause troubles. On the other hand, intermittent complete heart block or intermittent heart block carries much worse prognosis because that is that happens suddenly and sometimes there may not be escape mechanism and people die suddenly. Uh, this is another worst case scenario, complete heart block and a patient is having escape rhythm, but escape rhythm is generating from the right bundle branch. So make sure when you come across a patient with bradycardia, you need to exclude a, uh, a secondary forces, especially uh, in uh, young people who are presented with uh, episode of uh, uh, reflex syncope due to vagal stimulation. And that vagal sti stimulation especially, it could last for a longer period, giving rise to uh, bradycardia ECT. And uh, secondary to pain, uh, intracranial pressure, ischemia, as I mentioned earlier, severe electrolyte imbalances like hyperkalemia, and uh, medical induced and toxins. Uh, so this is an uh, ECG that I want to, uh, I, I think you can see this. You can see this a patient with complete heart block and appreciate the QRS morphology in uh, frontal plane. Frontal plane means lead, uh, limb leads. You can see if they are broad and uh, appreciate the QRS morphology on, on the precordial lead. It appears like left bundle, isn't it? So this patient is having complete heart block and the escape is like left bundle branch block appearance. So that means that patient's AV node is not functioning, bundle of his is not functioning, left bundle is not functioning. The patient rhythm is simply survive on the right bundle. So these, these rhythms are very unstable and they can die suddenly. Uh, this is a, a very recent ECG that I have come across. This patient had a kidney transplant. And uh, suddenly the patient developed a syncope episode while he was at home and he recovered. And then he was brought to the a &E, not here, other peripheral hospital. While they were taking the ECG, this patient uh, lost his consciousness. And the person who was doing the ECG, can you appreciate this is the first ECG? I don't know, I'm not sure whether this is very clear. You can see a relatively fast going uh, rhythm. And here, you can see that there are all these tiny uh, deflections are P waves. That is P waves only. There's no, this is called ventricular standstill. 
and the person who was taking the ecg was not aware of the situation he had taken the 12 complete 12 lead ecg and so this is a disaster luckily the patient survived and uh, we ha i had to put a pacemaker so this is called uh, complete heart block with ventricular standstill okay uh, the, this is a, a complete heart block with narrow escape. You can see the QRS complexes are uh, narrower, less than 120 milliseconds, and these rhythms are stable. So how do we uh, manage a patient who presented to us with bradycardia? Uh, uh, and as we know, all these uh, colleges and uh, societies has their own recommendation as to how we manage uh, in Sri Lankan setup, most of the time, what we follow is European or UK resuscitation council guidelines. So if we approach the, it's called ABCD approach. So we're gonna have to assess the patient. So I will more focus on how, how we're gonna manage the rhythm component. So if you found the patient is unconscious, in American setup, uh, if, if an adult patient is unconscious, they are, they are always going to assume that the patient is in cardiac arrest. Okay, and we're going to have to start a CPR. Okay. And uh, if there, when there's evidence of shock or evidence of ischemia or evidence of a peripheral underperfusion or when the patient is in heart failure symptoms and a pa patient has significant bradycardia, firstly, what we're going to give is atropine. That is a life-saving measure. And they recommend to give 0. 0.6 milligrams. But in our experience, sometimes 0. 0.6 milligrams may not work. So we can go up to five vials. You could give, give two vials or three vials at once and, and, and then assess the rhythm. And uh, so it is important that you would look for features that are uh, life-threatening in nature or, or precipitate cardiac arrest in, in time to come. So a recent asystole and advanced AV nodal blocks, as remember the things I have shown earlier, like left bundle branch, a complete heart block with left bundle branch appearance and, uh, and, and having a significant pauses more than three seconds. So in that case, you will have to uh, ask for expert opinion. Uh, this is something I wanted to highlight. And this is something I found uh, lacking in our hospital setup that we don't have facilities for transcutaneous pacing. If I'm correct, even in our a &E, uh, I don't think we have it. We have, this, we have the equipment, but unfortunately, we don't have the uh, uh, self-adhesive adhesive, uh, uh, defibrillation patches. And cardiology, we have, and we know how useful it can be. And uh, I will strongly recommend who are for in charge uh, people to get these things into a unit. And it is in our MSD, Medical Sup Supplies Division, they have these things. And make sure when the annual estimation comes and ask for them, and have them and, and learn how to use it. It could be very, very uh, easy scenario and especially uh, pandemic situation like this. And we are not very happy to go close to our patients in order even to do CPR or give a shock. So this is the answer. Okay. And uh, this is actually, these are the machines that we have. All of them have, you can appreciate that. You can set this is the pacing uh, mode. And, in, in this side, this is this is where we, we set up uh, start uh, set up our uh, transcutaneous spacing, and uh, you can uh, these self self adhesive uh, uh, patches. They come with uh, uh, connectors that you can connect to the monitor, and you can use it. Uh, so uh, when we setting up uh, transcutaneous spacing, because uh, uh, we, we know the heart is inside the thoracic cavity and there is a distance between where we keep our patches and, and the heart. So there is a, uh, the tissue in between and it causes an impedance. So we have to make sure that uh, in order to uh, make sure that the pa uh, patient heart, heart is contracting appropriately, uh, we have to uh, uh, shave the body hair and, uh, and uh, we have to make sure that the patient is having proper uh, con con uh, conduct or the connection uh, or the contact with the, the, the patch. So the problem is transcutaneous spacing. It is, uh, if the patient is unconscious, it is, it is very painful because I don't know whether anyone has seen transcutaneous spacing. 
uh, when we apply the patch and start pacing, it will start to contract, uh, depolarize the pectoral muscles and the diaphragm as well. So it is very uncomfortable. The patient hand will be moving and uh, hiccups will be there and it is, uh, they find it very uncomfortable. We have to sedate them. Uh, the one of the most important thing uh, is to make sure that the patient heart is contracting. How we're gonna do just by looking at a ECG monitor will not help because the transcutaneous spacing itself generate lots of uh, noises. And sometimes the ECG is not clear enough to see at all. And you need to physically make sure that the patient heart is contracting. So the best way to do either to check the femoral pulses or, uh, and if you have a pulse oximeter, that is the other best thing. So check the pulse oximeter, check for the waveform. And if that waveform is there, and that certainly tell you that the patient's heart is contracting. So uh, if you are talking about uh, medical management or in, in an emergency setup, what we have is atropine. Initial dose is 0.6 milligram IV. You could repeat every three to five minutes up to total dose of three, that is the uh, recommended doses. Uh, certainly we can use other sympathomimetics like dopamine and, and IV adrenaline I have found is quite useful. You don't have to give one milligram. Uh, you could start giving like 0.25 milligram or 0.5 milligram uh, because it has to be done cautiously. If you give a large dose of IV adrenaline, it might shoot the blood pressure up and it, give, it gives you unnecessary uh, sympathetic activation. I have seen people, one, one, one occasion I remember, a patient who was awaiting for pacemaker implantation at the board suddenly uh, collapsed due to a sudden, uh, uh, sudden complete heart block. And uh, we had to give adrenaline and the patient next, uh, next time ended up having ventricular fibrillation. So we had to shock the patient. Patient is back in asystole and we had to give adrenaline. And then we again, patient went into VF, we had to shock and this circle was uh, keep repeating until, uh, uh, until we were able to have a TPM in. So if you are to give adrenaline, uh, don't give one milligram, just use 0.25 or 0.5 milligram. That certainly will do the job. The isoprenaline we have is certainly a good medication in this type of situation. And this is normally the uh, dose. Uh, if you suspect like calcium channel blocker overdose, you could use calcium gluconate. And uh, the, the most important point is if you suspect myocardial infarction, giving atropine, dopamine, or adrenaline certainly will worsen the hypoxia uh, to the myocardial tissue. It might, it might aggravate the myocardial ischemia. That's something we need to be careful. That's why I was mentioning uh, about adrenaline specifically. Uh, uh, judiciously titrate the dose just to preserve life and until we do something permanent. So what's the diagnosis in here? Certainly it's bradycardia. So the first ECG, I'm not, unfortunately it's not very clear. There's no P wave. So this is called a sinus, uh, uh, sinus arrest. So there's no sinus activity, but the patient is having a escape rhythm generating from the AV node. And, and this is called sinoatrial exit block. Uh, suddenly the sinus nodes stop, stop functioning for a brief period. And there's no escape rhythm generating as well. And, uh, and then the sinus nodes started to function. So the, all this belongs to what we call sick sinus syndrome. And as I mentioned earlier, generally sick sinus syndrome does not uh, proved to be fatal on its own, right? But what happened when a patient develops uh, something like this, that they might collapse. Uh, do you know for how long we uh, heart does heart needs to stop contracting before one lose his consciousness? It's generally six seconds, four to six seconds. So we have seen that when a patient uh, is observed, when they have when their heart stop, their conscious level maintain up to four seconds and then only they, they lose their consciousness. These are generally not life-threatening, but uh, I have seen people uh, putting TPM for situation like this, generally not indicated we should be able to manage medically this type of situation.
So moving from that, we will discuss a bit about tachycardia emergencies. So there are various types of tachycardia situation that we can come across. So based on the morphology of the ECG and the regularity of the rhythm uh, and, and hemodynamic status, we can classify them to uh, various categories, subgroups. So on the top, we have pulseless VTVF, and then we have broad complex regular tachycardias. We have narrow complex regular tachycardias, and we have uh, narrow complex irregular tachycardias and broad complex irregular tachycardias. And we have polymorphic VT and, and this condition called electrical storm. So this is the 2021 uh, resuscitation council guidelines. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, so if a patient, if you found your patient is hemodynamically unstable, if your patient may be collapsed when at the time the patient coming to you, or uh, and in that case, you need to start CPR. And uh, that's purely the uh, resuscitation. Uh, and, and if you have enough time to uh, look for these things, whether the patient is in shock, uh, or having evidence of ischemia or having heart failure, uh, doesn't take a chance, no need to take a chance, go for synchronized DC cardio version. And, and if you are certain that the patient is having stable rhythm, then you can do all kinds of assessment. The other important thing I need to highlight, and I know that people, uh, when they come across it, an emergency situation, when a patient is unconscious, they certainly start giving CPR, there's no problem. But when the patient is stable enough, most of the time, especially when the patient is having a uh, when suspected having a ventricular tachycardia, they rush to intervene uh, before getting an ECG. Uh, I need to highlight that having an ECG uh, carrying the rhythm is very important from our point of view. And uh, recently I had to come across a situation that patient was uh, having an ICD put in came to the a &E with a VT. There was a mention of having VT and they have intervened, but unfortunately there wasn't ECG. And that patient was having an ICD put in and the patient did not receive a shock from the device. So, and we don't have the ECG. So I was scratching my head as to what has happened in this case. So then only again, he came only to realize like that time he was having an ECG only to realize that VT was rather slow one. It's like 120, but the ICD was set to detect if the rate is beyond 160. So the ICD is not doing its job. And we, since we didn't have ACG, we don't have a clue as to what happened. So if the patient's rhythm is stable, uh, make sure, uh, please take an ECG uh, before intervene because it'll help us in so many ways uh, uh, in order to, uh, uh, how are we gonna deal about it? So normally pulses VT and VF, patient will be unconscious. And uh, the, the key to save the life is to start CPR immediately. And in, in our setup, especially in a hospital setup, if you find, found a patient is collapsed, you have to assume that patient is, 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 is in arrest state or having pulses VT or a VF. Start CPR before, taking, before confirming any, any rhythm issues. And, and that's the only way to survive. And while we are giving CPR, uh, someone has to attend uh, uh, to make sure that the patient get uh, defibrillation. So it should be high dose unsynchronized energy. Now, almost all defibrillate, what we have is biphasic. So the generally dose is should be, uh, though it says 150, I wouldn't recommend to go with 150, it's go straight away with the highest possible dose to 200 joules and, and, and uh, make sure that the patient rhythm is restored. So <clears throat> immediate, when, if you, when you give a shock, don't try to confirm that whether it has worked, start CPR and go for two minutes, then only check the rhythm. Okay. And in the meantime, someone has to attend the uh, airway and give oxygen and having a cannula put in and prepare for vasopressors and in case. So if, if you find that the patient's uh, rhythm is so shock resistant, then you need to consider IV amiodarone. It is the best choice that we have. So IV amiodarone, 300 milligram, at least over three minutes with 5% glucose, 20 ml. And then you can give another 150. And if the con if and generally after giving IV amiodarone, you can give another shock. And uh, normally it works. 
and then make sure that you don't uh, you don't stop. Especially with, this is true for pulse and sweetie and VF, and uh, make sure that you complete the rest of the armature on those. So uh, basically, I'm repeating the same thing. So uh, there are a few uh, like you know we need to concentrate on giving safe and effective deep replacement. That's why I was mentioning uh, having a pads, a self additive pads could be like very useful in this type of situation. You can maintain your distance, you can deliver them safely uh, without having uh, to fear, especially in this uh, uh, pandemic situation. And there are various ways that uh, we can apply. It's, gen it's called anterolateral. You can go uh, anterior, posterior, or biaxillary. There are so many ways that you can apply uh, patches. And, and nowadays, obviously, lots of patients, you, you will come across certainly in your life, patients who are having pacemakers, ICDs, put in. And uh, it's, you need to be aware about the fact that the patient is having a pacemaker. So you have to make sure that you put the the IC uh, shocking pads away as further away from the device in order to minimize the damage to the device. So make sure that at least eight centimeters away from the device because this shock can uh, damage the pacemaker um, uh, uh, circuit and certainly that could give you more trouble. So there is some place for lidocaine or lignocaine. That is the lignocaine what we have. Make sure you're not going to give it adrenaline, the plain lignocaine that we normally use for local anesthetic. That's the same, same medication you can use. Especially if you're suspected having an uh, arrhythmia in the presence of ischemia, uh, lidocaine can work. And when, when you come across a situation where you can't give amiterone, lignocaine has a place. So I don't know whether you have heard this term, this electrical storm. Electrical storm is persistent cardiac uh, electrical uh, instability. That means the patient is getting repeated VF or VT. And it is a very difficult scenario. And uh, uh, normally these patients carry very high risk of uh, dying uh, during that admission. And normally this happens due to persistent uncorrected uh, something underlying uncorrected issue like persistent ongoing ischemia, uh, maybe sepsis, uh, maybe electrolyte imbalances, something driving and 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 in, enhance uh, adrenergic surge. Uh, in this type of situation, we have to make sure that you load the patient with amidron. And uh, sometimes amidron may not be sufficiently enough. You need to approach this patient in multiple pathways. You need to cut down their uh, adrenergic surge and you will have to use IV beta blockers in type of situation. And uh, it basically, sedation is very important. These patients are very anxious and they have significant adrenergic surge and adrenergic surge is driving the, the tachycardia. So we need to uh, sedate them properly and you might need the anesthetic support and you might have to intubate them, give certain uh, um, uh, medication um, and thoracic epidural anesthesia anesthetics should be able to help um, uh, help with this and there's another thing called stellate, stellate ganglion block and this is something I believe uh, uh, anyone who is in the emergency department should be familiarized with uh, and you will come across this scenario as well uh, patients who are having ICDs coming with repeated shocks delivering from the ICD. We know that ICD has a cap capability of giving shocks, but for, for limited number. Normally it's 120 or 200 uh, shocks from device. So if the ICD start giving shock uh, over and over and over and again, the battery will be depleted like nothing. So you need to have, avoid that happening as well. The simple way to do is to, uh, one, if the, once, once you are making sure that you have other means of uh, attending the arrhythmia, you can uh, simply, uh, uh, put uh, keep a magnet over the ICD and it will stop stop giving shocks. Uh, that is how we're going to do the left uh, stellate ganglion block. Normally we try it from the left side. It, you can try it from the right side as well. But as we know in anatomical term, the left sympathetic ganglion supplies the uh, the heart. So we need to target the left stellate ganglion. It is generally just uh, at the uh, out. Uh, 
uh, inferior border of the cricoid thyroid, uh, just uh, at the uh, C6 uh, spinal tubercle. And you need to approach from the lateral side. And generally what we're going to infiltrate is BP BPOCAIN. So you, you can do it blindly, but uh, it will be best to do it under uh, ultrasound guidance. And our, I believe our anesthetists, they are quite uh, familiar with the thing. And this can be very helpful, especially in order to prevent uh, getting recurrent VTVF. And use ultrasound scan. You can see carotid artery here, internal jugular vein. You approach from the left side, this uh, uh, C6 vertebral body. And this is generally, if you approach from the left uh, side, uh, if you get underneath the uh, common carotid artery, and this is where normally you need to inject bupivacaine, and that will temporarily block the sympathetic chain and, and, and reduce the adrenaline surge to the heart, and it will help to uh, uh, settle the heart. So, uh, White complex regular tachycardia, there are so many uh, possibilities. It could be a monomorphic ventricular tachycardia. As we know, some of the supraventricular tachycardias can present and as with white complex tachycardia. And, uh, and some, some very occasionally supraventricular tachycardia itself uh, presented with a broad complex tachycardia in the presence of certain medication and uh, having electrolyte uh, imbalances in the middle. Antidromic AVNRT is a, is a condition where you know WPW syndrome, isn't it? So WPW, in WPW syndrome, patients has more than one connection between the uh, atria and the ventricle. And normally, as we know, sinus when the sinus node fires, that conduction, the ventricle activation happens through the normal conduction, and it gives rise to narrow complex. In this type of tachycardia, what happens? The ventricle is activated solely through the accessory pathway, and that electrical activity come back up on to the atrium through the normal conduction and go back down on the accessory pathway. So giving rise a uh, re-entry, re completing the re-entry circuiting and initiating a tachycardia. Because of the ventricle is activated through the accessory pathway, it will give rise to broad complex appearance. So uh, if a patient who presented with white clumps is regular tachycardia, if the patient is un unresponsive, we need to uh, follow the advanced cardiac life support algorithm. So we need to start CPR and as early as possible, we need to deliver the shock. If a patient who is unstable but conscious, go for synchronized cardiovation. And if the patient is stable, then take a little bit of time to do a diagnosis and please uh, make sure that you have a, an ECG taken. Uh, so this is what is recommended here. White complex QRS tachycardia. If the patient is even and unstable, go for synchronized cardioversion. Make sure it is synchronized cardioversion. So you need to familiarize yourself how to how to synchronize. There's a button in the the defibrillator. You need to have the ECG uh, uh, um, connect. The, the patient need to be connected to the defibrillator to the ECG, and then you need to push that button. Start uh, the shock push that button and it'll tell you whether it is synchronizing or not. And then you, then you need to select your energy and deliver the shock. It's important to follow that because unsynchronized uh, shocks can initiate ventricular fibrillation in this type of scenario. Normally it's, you could start with 120 to 150 and uh, then uh, you could give amidrone if you like. And uh, there is a place for vagal maneuvers, even in situation, considering the fact that I mentioned earlier, some supraventricular tachycardia can present in white complex, um, white complex tachycardia. So there is, a, there is a chance you can, if the patient is stable enough that, and you think that it, is, it could be a supraventricular tachycardia, you could still compress the uh, carotid uh, um, um, sinus and, and uh, try do some vehicle maneuvers. Though we use uh, amidaron, it is not the first choice, unfortunately. Uh, and you can even try IV giving IV adenosine, but I, I wouldn't recommend that because uh, it needs lots of other information before you safely use the IV adenosine 
in in a white clumps is tachycardia situation you need to have previous ecg sometimes our patient they just simply come to the ard without having for previous documents so it's not wise to give iv adenosine in a, in a in a in a white clump text tachycardia uh can anyone tell the diagnosis here i believe you can appreciate this is a tachycardia and it's regular and it is broad i have highlighted the the important feature in here you can see the axis lead 1 lead 2 3 avf both all are negative and lead 1 is you could hardly say uh, so th there's certainly a left axis deviation and v1 that is rsr pattern small r small s then a big r so this is called a, a rabbit ear or v1 so what is the diagnosis you can appreciate this a white complex regular tachycardia yeah? and uh, any guesses so the, the the clue is normally unless there is underlying uh, conduction tissue disorder sweeties do not present with left axis deviation and right bundle branch combination and if you see this, it's very likely to be a VT, right bundle branch appearance and left axis deviation. So this is actually a patient who had a, uh, there's a thing called uh, idiopathic left ventricular tachycardia, fascicular VT. This is simply a patient who presented with a fascicular VT. And the important thing is this patient can simply be managed with giving verapamil. You don't need to give amidron anything else. If you give verapamil, the tachycardia will stop. This is called verapamil sensitive uh, fascicular VT. But sometimes not easy to diagnose. The clue is they have right bundle branch block appearance and the left axis deviation. And these, these, these are safe tachycardia. Generally, they, they don't kill the patient and, and, and can be managed with verapamil. Giving, just simply giving verapamil will stop the tachycardia. This is all certainly one of the situations we can use verapamil in managing uh, ventricular tachycardia. What is this? And you can see lead two, three ABF strongly positive. And uh, this is AVR. AVR is negative. We know that AVR is somewhere here, isn't it? In frontal plane. Two, three are here, a and AVF, they are here, the inferior leads. AVR is here, and uh, AV, uh, uh, AVL is there, lead one is here. So AVR is negative, and two, three, are, two, three AVF is positive. That means whatever the electrical activity travels towards the inferior leads. That's why it is positive. And V1 is negative. V1 is a right side lead, isn't it? It is in the right record here. And, uh, so it is negative. That means the electrical activity travels away from. So this is a typical right ventricular outflow tract VT. And these are benign VTs. And you might be able to manage with them beta blockers or, and they are amenable for ablations. A uh, little bit about polymorphic VT. Uh, we know that uh, polymorphic VT uh, happens when the, the QRS pattern change. And uh, the problem with uh, polymorphic VT, they can simply degenerate it into ventricular fibrillation. And uh, in the important point is if you suspect the polymorphic VT, don't use amidron. And the reason is most of the time polymorphic VT happens in the presence of a QT prolongation. And if you give amidron, it will worsen. And that is a disaster. And the first choice should be if the unless the patient is hemodynamically unstable, you cannot give a shock. But if the patient is stable, give magnesium. And uh, in certain scenarios, even temporary trans uh, trans uh, transvenous spacing can improve uh, polymorphic VTs as well. And if a Brugada patient comes with polymorphic VT, you are going to give isoprenaline. Isoprenaline will stop the tachycardia. And so that's why I see the polymorphic VTs could be very, very, very heterogeneous group. So uh, based on what you suspect, so it's very important if you come across, uh, get an expert help because uh, simply giving amidron will not help you. Uh, you can see that in this case, 
see uh, this patient is having PVC coming from what we are we call them short couple PVC and you can appreciate that the PVC is simply coming just on top of the QRS couple uh, T wave this is sort of an R on T phenomena it is called short couple PVC and you can see PVC was happening and this is a sinus speed then the PVC and it start the uh, um, uh, the polymorphic PT and this patient was connected to the monitor. You can see the uh, what happened to the blood pressure. So this almost in cardiac arrest. Isn't it? This is the uh, the uh, pulse wave pattern and it has gone disappeared. So that's what I mentioned. Polymorphic PT could be a is a very heterogeneous group. Uh, so we would need to be aware of about what is the normal QT intervals. And normally in prepubertal age, it's 146, uh, for, um, sorry, uh, for 460 milliseconds, uh, irrespective of gender. But once they grow up a bit older, uh, uh, the, 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 the cutoff value changes. This is 99 percentile cutoff value that one needs. This thing, it's important. And this is corrected. Uh, uh, corrected QT values. So that's what I mentioned. It's a heterogeneous group. People come, can come with uh, long QT. It could be either acquired or congenital. And some, there are certain situations where you could develop polymorphic VT without the QT prolongation. Brugada syndrome is one of the good examples. And I've seen patients who are having right ventricular outflow tract uh, PVCs generating polymorphic VT. And most importantly, acute myocardial infarction, that is uh, something you need to be aware of. And generally, uh, they can develop VT in various stages. It could be uh, having, uh, without having any evidence of ongoing ischemia. They have simply uh, obstructive coronary artery disease, but not an MI. And they develop uh, uh, because of the agitation of the Purkinje fibers caused by the chronic ischemia or they can develop a polymorphic VT mostly three to four days at, from the onset of MI. And there's another group called catecholamidic sensitive polymorphic VT, CPVT, we know. They normally develop a v, uh, polymorphic VT uh, when they do something active or is involved in sports. So uh, you can see that the uh, uh, COVID type of ST elevations, this is Brugada, and and normally Brugada patients, they develop v, uh, VF not when they are alert, not when they are active. They normally develop when they are at rest, especially during nights. What happens is uh, they develop PVC and, and, and that initiate VF. So this is a patient with MI. You can see that ST elevation is here. And, uh, and, and that instability leading to PVCs and generating polymorphic VT. This is another example. And this is uh, what we call bidirectional VT in uh, uh, catecholaminergic sensitive uh, CPVT patients. They normally develop during sympathetic activation when they become agitated or during exercises. It will generate uh, change, uh, PVCs. Uh, changing axes and then degenerate into polymorphic VT. Uh, this is another important thing that uh, pre-excited AF, WPW syndrome patients, when they develop AF, they could simply present like polymorphic VT. And, and in this situation, we need to manage entirely different way. And this is something some one need to be familiar with. So don't Remember that uh, if you come across a uh, abnormal, bizarre looking ECG, uh, you need to uh, think, could this be a pre-excited atrial fibrillation? So emergency therapy should be discontinuation of any medication and make sure potassium is corrected. Uh, patient need to be sedated very well and giving ad Intravenous magnesium would be the 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 the, the life saving uh, option in in that scenario. Moving from that uh, more simpler tachycardias, when we come across a narrow complex regular tachycardias, 
There are a few differential diagnoses one need to consider. Sinus tachycardia, focal atrial tachycardia, all sort of atrial flutters, AV nodal, uh, um, AV NRTs, and this is a, a narrow complex tachycardia variant of WBW patient. And very occasionally, like the uh, atria firing on its own, AV node can still start firing on its own, giving rise to junctional tachycardia. They are generally very well tolerated tachycardia. You have time, uh, enough time uh, to deal these patients uh, without having to rush. But occasionally, hemodynamic compromise can occur if the tachycardia is going faster than 20, 220. 200 beats, and if a patient is already having an underlying structural abnormality, especially obstructive lesion, aortic stenosis, mitral stenosis, uh, pul pulmonary hypertension, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, because they are just hanging uh, by the thread, and when they started to have a tachycardia, the hemodynamic compromise happened. So this is how we normally assess uh, or approach these patients. The key is to look for hemodynamic instability. There is no question if there's hemodynamic instability, you're gonna cardiovert them, giving synchronized DC cardioversion. And when the patient is stable, then you have time, all the time to do all kinds of other maneuvers. Generally, a sinus tachycardia, it's very important, sinus tachycardia, you need to exclude. It's, it's sometimes it's difficult to uh, uh, spot sinus tachycardia. Sinus tachycardia could be very fast. And generally, as a rule, if you if you reduce the patient age from 220, suppose the patient is 60, and uh, if you reduce 60 from 220, that is uh, 160, isn't it? And if you take 85 percent of of that, roughly around 150, that means so that is that is much about the heart rate of sinus heart rate can go up. So that is from that, you can get an idea whether the tachycardia is actually sinus or not. You get my point? Reduce the age from 220 and take the 85% of it. And that is generally give the, 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 the highest sinus rate one can achieve based on the age. And, uh, and, and if you get a narrow compass tachycardia, if you, if you have a doubt whether it is sinus tachycardia or not, Simply, you, if you, you can uh, calculate the, the probable sinus rate the patient can go and compare with the uh, uh, tachycardia rate. But uh, I have seen people uh, under extreme uh, sympathetic activation like in severe sepsis, they can go, can have sinus rate uh, as high as 220 or even more than that. So make sure that if a patient come to you with sinus tachycardia to the A and then you need to look for a possible, it could be a, uh, in, a feature of impending cardiac arrest. Suppose a patient who's having a bleeding of unknown origin and patient has bled enough and the patient is uh, trying to compensate it with sinus tachycardia. So it's important always look all these things a patient come across his sinus tachycardia. Uh, focal atrial tachycardia. Uh, Simple, the same rule. If the patient, if you think the patient is hemodynamically unstable, uh, you can use a small dose of synchronized cardioversion. 70 to 120 joules should be able to do the trick. Uh, this is a ECG uh, with a narrow compressed regular tachycardia. Anyone can come up with a diagnosis? You can see uh, there's the QRF and there's another QRF. And there's only a small deflection. You don't know whether it is a T or P. We don't know that. So there's uh, R, R, and there's another deflection, and then another R, another deflection, another R. So it's, we don't know exactly what it is, isn't it? So it could be sinus tachycardia. It could be atrial tachycardia. And here it comes. And when we give digoxin, what happened? You could see the... Uh, clearly, the P waves are marching, and there's more. Uh, the QRS rate has come down, so more uh, P waves than QRS. So this is a atrial tachycardia. The same patient. Uh, the other uh, narrow complex regular tachycardia could be atrial flutter. Uh, 
uh, this is again arrow of the cellular tachycardia. Uh, I'm, I have highlighted the V1, and uh, I don't know whether you can see, there's a small sharp deflection just after the QR is complex. Uh, this, is, this is called R prime. This is a characteristic feature of AVNRT. Because as we know, in AVNRT, the, the re-entry circuit is in the, in the AV node. So the, both the atria and ventricles are activating at the same time. Uh, as a result of it, QRS, P wave is falling just on top of the QRS complexes. And this is, normally this can be seen in V1 and occasionally in inferior leads uh, as a uh, small S wave or a, or a small R in V1 that is called as, uh, R prime or S prime. Uh, it is a characteristic feature of AVNRT. In a, if you come across an AVNRT, the first thing you need to try is vagal manual if, as long as the patient is stable. And if not the case, then you could consider giving a, a shock, a low energy shock. And, uh, but most of the time, if, if it not helped by the vagal manuals, you will consider giving IV adenosine. And this is all same for the WPW tachycardia, uh, WP blood syndrome patients coming with a narrow complex tachycardia. You could uh, try the vagal manuals, and if it does not help out, you could give, uh, consider giving IV adenosine because uh, IV adenosine is a medication that acts on the AV node. And all these tachycardia, their mechanism is exclusively depend on the conduction of the AV node. So the theory is if you obstruct the conduction through the AV node, the, the tachycardia circuit should break and tachycardia should be stopped. By doing the wave gull maneuver, we are doing the same thing because of the wave gull stimulation, it will lead to uh, the conduction delay occurs in the AV node and it will break the circuit, slows down and stop. So IV adenosine, make sure that you give rapidly, uh, use the, uh, the anti-cubital vein rather than giving through uh, the uh, palm or the dorsum of the palm with small veins, use the anti-cubital vein, give six milligram. And, if, and should, should, if it is going to work, it should work quickly. And you can try up to max 12 at once and you can repeat up to 12 and make sure that you give uh, a big flush and the, the effect is quick and uh, normally they, people tolerate this will, uh, uh, without having any issue. But sometimes you need to be aware in certain situation if the patient is having a central line, like in a uh, ICU setup, don't give six, you, instead you can give three milligrams you are going to give through the central line. And especially patient is on carbamazepine and uh, there are little, little things that one need to be careful. Uh, uh, could, uh, I think we have Verapamil in our uh, uh, A&E, is that correct? So normally uh, we, uh, we could uh, use giving uh, Verapamil IV or DTSM IV, or uh, I don't think we have beta blockers, do we? We don't. And uh, if, if we are going to give IV beta blockers, it should be metaprolol. And, uh, and they are very successful in stopping the tachycardia. And I have to tell you, I have I, recently I have come across two situations where AVNRT was given uh, amidron. There's no need to give amidron in for AVNRTs. Uh, vagal maneuvers and 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 IV verapamil should should stop the tachycardia. And uh, I'm not going to talk, talk about lot about acute AF. Uh, it's beyond our scope. It's an entirely different thing. Normally. Uh, Acute AF, as we know, we don't know for how long they, these patients was, was in AF, but if we are certainly sure that the patient is having a very uh, new onset of AF, we don't have to bother about uh, uh, giving, especially after a binge of alcohol, they come with acute AF. Uh, you could simply give them a beta blocker or normally it does not cause uh, hemodynamic uh, compromise in an in a otherwise fit person, but uh, patient with uh, uh, underlying ischemic heart disease or heart failure, uh, even acute uh, atrial fibrillation, especially hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or mitral stenosis patient or aortic stenosis patient like those who have already uh, compromised status, when they develop atrial fibrillation, especially mitral stenosis patient, as we know, uh, mitral stenosis patient, they, their ventricular filling is entirely depend on the, the atrial contraction. 
because there's no passive filling because of the mitral valve is stenosed and they are depend on the atrial key. And if they develop atrial fibrillation, suddenly they, they, they deteriorate. So in certain scenario, you might have to consider cardio in them. And multifocal atrial tachycardia, uh, magnesium uh, proved to be uh, having a benefit or effect. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, if you think the patient is hemodynamically unstable, uh, don't consider about the risk of having a stroke. Uh, you might want to cardio work them. Uh, basically, I'll be uh, better to avoid calcium channel blockers in this type of scenario because uh, these patients tend to have LV dysfunction and it's not. It's going to make things worse for us, and therefore the choice should be IV metoprolol or IV amitriptyline. Okay, what is the abnormality in here? This is something I mentioned earlier. It's, you can see it's a very broad, a bizarre, and an irregular. This is the exact appearance of this called pre-excited AF. So this patient has WPW syndrome and developed atrial fibrillation. So the atrial fibrillation we know in, in atrial fibrillation, the atrial activity can go as fast as 600 beats per minute, atrial activity. But in normal people, because of the AV conduction uh, by default doesn't allow, AV node doesn't allow that much of fast conduction to go down. Because when, when the ventricle started to uh, uh, depolarize at a rate of 300 or above, the VF risk goes up. So in nature, in order to preserve life, AV node doesn't allow that to happen. But when they have an accessory pathway, that, that, that is an escape. And accessory pathway has no regard and it allows fast conduction to go down. And so the ventricle can activate very fast. You can see here almost the rate 300 at one point. And you could see the complexes are so bizarre and broad, narrow, and all variable. So this looks like a polymorphic VT, but this is pre-excited AF. This is an emergency situation. These people suddenly can go into VF. So best these patients manage make sure that you avoid amiodarone in this situation. Don't give amiodarone, cardio at them. Don't give, don't give adenosine, don't give beta blockers, don't give calcium channel blockers, because they will reduce the uh, AV conduction and worsen the conduction or improve the conduction through the accessory pathway, no regulation, and they will simply go into VF. So cardio at them. Okay, this is my last slide. Can anyone tell the diagnosis here? Is this an artifact or is this a, is it a tachycardia? What is it? Okay. Uh, the clue is here. What is the rate? Now we can see it's a regular, broad, complex something, isn't it? And uh, and the rate is ninety six. Can this be a VT? Generally, uh, VTs are relatively fast. There's a thing called idiopathic. Uh, I mean, idioventricular VTs. They can be slower, but uh, and I'll tell you the diagnosis. This is hyperkalemia. This is called sine wave and this patient is about to die, you can see. So the P wave is gone, QRS and T all are merged together. Give me rise to this. This, this patient's was, potassium was around nine. And this is peri arrest rhythm and the rate is slower. The, that was the clue. So these, these certainly sometimes you, you will come across these things. Thank you. Uh, in Brugada patients, what happens is, uh, there is a there's a lot of theory about it. It's a it's a deep combination of deeper depolarization and repolarization abnormality, specifically happening in the right ventricular outflow tracheal. And uh, until re up until recently, we were thinking it was a only an electrical issue. But there are lots of evidence coming uh, coming up to say that it's not functional. There is some structural abnormality. There is a place for ablations in Bugada patients. That is, we can 
go epicardially onto the RVOT and we can ablate those areas. And uh, mind, uh, mind you, I can tell you this Brugada chain just disappears. So Brugada syndrome can be cured now, apart from giving ICDs. And other thing is, as mentioned earlier, Brugada patient, they develop arrhythmia normally in the presence of vagal activation. That is generally after a period of exercise while they were resting, after a meal or during sleep. And other circumstances is uh, uh, when they have hypothermia or fever. There was a patient, I, unfortunately, I don't have that ECG with me. A patient came to the hospital with chest pain, but he was having fever. He was having a ECG that was identical to ST elevation in mind. And they have given TNK as well. And, and patient was having fever. When the fever settled, then the Brugada changes started to appear. So it was actually a, a Brugada patient who was having uh, extenuated changes because of the fever. So Brugada syndrome, patient, they can be treated with isoprenaline or osoprenaline if they have lots of erythia, or we can do ablations. So uh, because we are short of uh, time, so we have to conclude the session. So uh, let me uh, thank Dr. J.T. Jewel Weber for his uh, excellent uh, presentation, even though it's too uh, low, but still it's uh, very uh, useful for us to learn a lot. Uh, so uh, thank you for reminding us some uh, rare ICGs and all. So uh, I will appreciate your effort and uh, thank you.